Hello there once again everyone, UXW Bill here, and going back a couple months on my videos, someone saw a police scanner in the background. Now that is a much newer unit than the one you see here. But they commented on it and asked if I was into police scanning. I don't remember who made the comment, but I'm sure they'll be along here soon enough. Anyway, I've never been seriously into playing with police scanners, but I do have a couple of them. Some old crystal-controlled Bearcats where you actually change the uh, crystal to adjust the frequency. And then I have some newer units from Bearcat Uniden and Radio Shack. And the Radio Shack scanners are actually the ones I use the most. But these old Bearcats are kind of neat because they're a very early example of electronically tuned or digitally tuned scanning radios. Such a thing wasn't all that common at the time these were made in the late 1970s, early 1980s. And these are the most common ones that you see right here. There are a number of different uh, models, and they all have different features. My dad owns a much fancier one. In fact, several people in my family have these. And they must have done a group buy or something, but they're all slightly different models with slightly different personalities. My dad's is still working perfectly to this day. This one that you see right here belonged to an uncle of mine who passed away about two months ago, and so it ended up falling into my lap after his passing. And while it tries valiantly to work, it's definitely got some issues. As you can see here, it's reporting a frequency that's nowhere near correct. There's microcontroller and AC line hum noise in the uh, speaker when the audio is turned up. Basically, it needs a lot of help, and one of these days I've got to decide if I'm actually going to go ahead and put the effort into doing that. Now, initially, these were made by the Electra Company, which later became a division of Masco Corporation of Indiana in Cumberland, Indiana. Now, the Electra Company and the Bearcat Scanner Line was later bought out by Uniden, who continued to use the name for a while and maybe even uses it today. The Bearcat scanners were actually named after an automobile known as the Bearcat. Now, I don't know too much about that, but I did read about the history of the company some years ago, and that's where the name was taken from by the scanner's inventor. So let's have a little demonstration of this one. Chicago is cloudy and 39. Indian there you Apple can clearly hear and the hum from the microcontroller cloudy, and the faint AC line hum. The hum from the microcontroller actually changes its pitch as you hit buttons, assuming this thing doesn't go completely bonkers here. That did. Oh well. One thing that you can definitely see, though, by playing with the buttons, you can see that the microcontroller is very slow, and when its uh, display updating routine is interrupted to handle input from the keypad, its multiplexing and driving of the display actually goes a little bit erratic while it processes and interprets the key press. Now see, it should be stopping on the weather band frequency, which is programmed into one of the memories. So this one definitely needs a little bit of help, but I'll get into that a little more later. I was hitting the thrift stores again, and you'd better believe that's a recipe for trouble. These things seem to be about everywhere, even though I'm sure they cost a lot of money back in the early 1980s when they were released, seems like a lot of people bought them. And I found one in the thrift stores, the next model up, a Bearcat 210XL. And I probably would have left it there, heaven knows I don't need any more of these things, but there was something about it that caught my eye. As you could very clearly see, this unit has an LED style display. And that, in fact, is the common display for all of these units that I have ever seen. So what makes the Bearcat 210 XL that I found different? As you can see, the keypad has changed a little bit, and this unit has definitely seen some action over its lifetime. In fact, when I got this thing, it was so filthy dirty that most of the keys on the keypad were unreadable, and the um, demarcations around the squelch and volume controls were also so covered and caked in dirt that they were unreadable. But that's not the big difference. The big difference is the display. This is the first one of these scanners I have ever seen, not that I suspect they're rare or anything like that, with a non-LED display. That's right, folks. It's got a vacuum fluorescent display in there, and it looks a lot like a calculator display. Although, as you can see, there's no notation for memory, error, or overflow. Still, those things could have been displayed with conventional single characters if they were ever needed. I thought this was kind of cool, 
so this unit ended up following me home for the thrift from the thrift store. As you can see, the display on this one is quite a bit different. And in fact, I could go in here, this one actually works properly, and I could program a frequency to be received. Range from the upper 20s in northern Iowa to near 50 degrees in southern Missouri. Clear. And you may be able to see that the display refresh frequency is not very high on this unit either. Now these aren't bad little radios, but they do have some common problems, and I'm going to show you some of the things that can actually go wrong with these when I pop the cover on this unit. These radios were actually made in two places, and they are relatively unique in that they are a fairly modern device that was actually assembled entirely by hand. Every solder joint in these things, all the case assembly, all that stuff was done by hand in one of two places. These radios were either built in Cumberland, Indiana, or in the case of this particular unit, Puerto Rico. That is indicated by the manufacturing number on the back, a P for Puerto Rico, or a C for Cumberland, Indiana. The other four digits, 4681 in this case, indicate the week and the year of this particular radio's manufacture. Now, I haven't come up with a whole lot of information on the difference in displays of these radios because I think that most people probably don't care. I'm kind of a weirdo when it comes to liking vacuum fluorescent displays and stuff like that. But I have a feeling that the LED display radios are actually newer than the vacuum fluorescent display ones. So let's have a look inside and see what's going on here. Here's the outer shell of the radio removed. This is just a simple matter of removing four screws at the bottom and the two pegs at the side that are provided as covers for the automotive mounting holes if you decide to install this thing in your car. These things are equally at home operating from AC line power or car power. And there is one of the first problems right there. These being electronically tuned radios, they need a way to keep their memory intact. And it seems that the Electra company was playing around with different ways to do this because I have seen three different systems. Like this radio uses a 9 volt battery to keep its memory intact and Electra claims that in the case of total absence of power this radio will only remember its stations for a period of 24 hours from the time that power was lost. This radio uses a different approach. It takes a set of tiny button batteries in an enclosed capsule in the back. Now this to me is a better approach, even though these batteries have relatively little ability to deliver a lot of current over time, but perhaps the power draw had dropped from this circuit compared to this radio over here because they claim in the manual that a couple of these batteries in this container will hold the memory on this radio for, I believe, about a month. My dad's radio, which I don't have handy right now, takes a pair of AA batteries and it seems to hold on to its settings for at least a year with those batteries in place if they're brand new good quality batteries. But that can lead to the first problem which will destroy these radios if it gets bad enough. People forget about them and leave the batteries in them and as you can see in this particular design with the 9 volt battery or the AA batteries either one if those batteries fail, they're going to leak their corrosive materials right on the circuit board, and they will ruin it. I have seen that kill these radios completely dead. So if you care about your Bearcat 200 series electronic scanning radio, please don't leave the batteries in it once they've failed. Nobody listens to that, of course, because every one of these that I have found, including that one over there, had thoroughly depleted batteries in it. Fortunately, I've never seen them leak, probably because I've had a lot of luck on my side, because repairing that would be truly, truly disastrous. Turning the radio over reveals that there are lots and lots of fun things going on here. Where a modern radio would probably have this circuitry all condensed into one simple integrated circuit, here you can actually get a feeling for what the signal's doing and where it's going. There are basically two boards in these radios, and you can see that they are definitely an early example of electronically tuned radio technology. You have the radio board up here, which also contains some power handling components. And then down here you have the microcontroller board. 
The microcontrollers used in these radios vary somewhat. This particular radio uses a TMS-1000 series microcontroller, and although the subject is hotly debated, this 4-bit microcontroller is actually rumored to have beaten the Intel 4004 to market by a month or two, depending upon who you ask and who your sources are. But what no one can deny is that th th this product, this TMS-1000, is definitely one of the earliest fully integrated microcontrollers to hit the market. It is a 4-bit microcontroller clocked at about 400 kilohertz. And given that the backup battery in this thing only lasts 24 hours in the absence of external power, I would guess that it never really completely goes to sleep, that maybe it's staying fully clocked or close to at all times. This particular microcontroller, to give you an idea, cannot run Crisis. Not with 2 kilobytes of ROM, 64 bytes of RAM, and a half a megahertz or so worth of clock speed. It is worth noting that slight variants of this same microprocessor were actually used in many other things, not the least of which was a toy you may have heard of known as the Texas Instruments Speak and Spell. There was also the Speak and Math, and I think there was a Speak and Reading, but don't quote me on that. I don't actually have any of those things, although I might like to get one someday. But this same microcontroller can be found in those devices doing slightly different work. That brings me to the second common problem with these radios. Since they are completely assembled by hand, you can see that the quality of the solder joints varies quite a bit. And one of the things that causes trouble in these radios after some time, or in some cases even back when they were brand new, is bad soldering. And you can see that there is definitely some indication that these soldering joints on the display module are not all that good. There are other component failures known in these radios, especially after some 30 odd years worth of use. Sometimes they need to be recapped, and you can see that this one's probably got at least one capacitor that has been stressed over its lifetime. There's a little transistor type voltage regulator there, and it was leaned up against that filter cap, and as you can see, it left a discoloration mark on it. Oops, I may have to replace that here in the near future. There on the bottom, of course, are the battery replacement instructions that explain how the battery should be replaced and which way it should be installed. They also give a list of recommended replacement batteries, and I wonder if you can actually still buy those particular batteries anymore. I wouldn't be surprised if you can get the EverReady or the Panasonic to this day, but the Mallory battery would better be known as a Duracell these days. Thank you for watching this video, and do feel free to leave a comment if you have one.